humility, a modest or low view of one's own importance in comparison to their peers. Rarely is this act exhibited by those in a position of power and influence. While they possess power great enough to reshape the very fabric of life, Jedi do not crave such things. Jedi serve, they do not rule. They protect, they do not attack. They view themselves as equals, not as superiors. But pride is a sickness that can infect even the noblest of beings and turn them into monsters. Even those as wise as the Jedi are not immune to the temptations that such power can bring, for power can corrupt as easily as it could save. The Force could grant an individual many gifts, even the ability to defy death, and that alone has driven many good knights into the deepest, darkest places. Humility is a key component in the Jedi's philosophy, but for some, the intoxication of power is too great, and the desire to subjugate the lesser is too strong. This is the story of greed. This is the story of Freedom Nad. Over 4,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, the planet Ossus was the center of Jedi training and historical study. Home to the Great Jedi Library, built and overseen by the ancient Jedi Master Odan Ur, Ossus was a sprawling metropolis. Jedi and their supporters from the inner core worlds and the outer rim alike, roaming its vast lands. The light side of the Force so strong here that it seemed to permeate from the very stone and grass that made up the planet's surface. It was on this wondrous world that the young man named Freedon Nad would begin his Jedi training. Like many of his fellow apprentices, Nad had grown up hearing of the Jedi Knights performing extraordinary deeds through their command of the Force, and he ached to stand among them. This eagerness, this desire to excel, showed itself in Nad's progress. In what seemed like no time since his arrival at the Jedi Training Center, he had forged a very deep understanding of the Force, and had crafted his own lightsaber. His weapon's blade was short and blazed with a bronze hue, as if accentuating the bright fire that burned Nad's soul. It did not take long for the masters to take notice of the young man's extraordinary progress. They were impressed not only by the rate in which he learned his teachings, but his openness to attain universal harmony. Many of the masters on Ossus actively took part in Nad's training, the young man even receiving one-on-one -on -one lessons with the library's founder, Odan Ur, a privilege only bestowed upon a select few. There was no doubt in the masters' minds that Nad would become a Jedi much sooner than his classmates. There was only one final test he needed to take before he could be bestowed upon the rank of Jedi Knight. The Test of Humility Frieden Nad's test would not be one of body, but one of spirit. A test to see how he could cope with failure, and whether or not he could stay true to the Jedi's ideals of selflessness. After years of training, the Masters announced that it was time to grant several apprentices the rank of Jedi Knight and fully induct them into the Order. Nad fully believed that his promotion was imminent. He knew he was better than his peers, and while they tried to hide it, he knew the Masters thought highly of him. Finally, he could fully realize his dreams. Finally, he could stand among the Jedi he worshipped as their equal. Finally, all his hardships would be worth it. Unfortunately, Nad's elation was short-lived as the masters completely passed over him during the ceremony. The apprentices picked and their decision final, and Nad was not one of them. The young man felt as if he had been stabbed, 
It was as if his very universe had come crashing down around him. He could not understand why the masters had not granted him his reward for all the progress and hard work he had demonstrated during his time on Ossus. He knew he was better than the other apprentices. The masters had all but said as much to his face. Had he done something wrong? Was there a lesson he missed or a test he failed? As he continued to dwell, anger and jealousy started to creep into Nad's mind, and a desire for vengeance slowly made its presence known. Still confused about what the masters expected of him, Nad sought out one of his instructors for advice. Mata Trimeon was one of the finest lightsaber instructors of her day, often spending hours on the outskirts of the Ossus city practicing her lightsaber techniques. As Nad approached the elderly woman, he was amazed at the level of skill in which she executed her sword moves. Her form was flawless, her transitions seamless. It was as if the practice of martial arts was as natural to her as breathing. Surely she would provide him with the guidance he so desperately desired. Nad positioned himself just outside the garden and waited, hoping to get her attention. Unfortunately, Trama said nothing and continued to practice her sequences. After 30 minutes of waiting, Nad grew frustrated and his anger came to a boiling point and he angrily approached the old master furious that his presence had gone unnoticed. In a flurry of movement, Master Tremayan brought her lightsaber to bear mere centimeters away from Nad's chest. With Nad stunned by her sudden acknowledgement of him, Tremayan then resumed her practice motions. This action, however, caused Nad to grow even more pensive, and he proceeded to storm away from the garden. Freedon came a withered voice from behind him. He stopped and slowly turned around. Mata stood with her lightsaber held before her. With a flick of her finger, the bright blade fell back into its hilt. Some things cannot be taught directly, she said, taking several steps toward him. Some things you must find in yourself. If we were to show it to you, to point at it and say, look, there it is, you would not understand. Jedi must be willing to look into their own hearts and spirits. If you do not, well, let us just say that you will never become a true Jedi. Master Tremayan, please, I do want to be a Jedi, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I just need you to point me in the right direction. If you'll just... I cannot. Why? Why won't you help me? I'm not asking you to hand everything to me. Just tell me what it is that's stopping me from becoming a Jedi Knight. I cannot, she said, her face and stance both devoid of emotion. A lance of anger suddenly found wake in his heart, and then, suddenly, all his anger and hurt he had been feeling focused into one single lump of emotion. Secrets, he shouted and stepped toward Matt. You, all of you, hide behind these secrets. You don't want us to learn them? No, that would take away your power, your place in the Force. As he came toward her, anger spilled into the rest of his body, crossing through his veins in powerful pulses. I am a Jedi. It doesn't matter what you say. I don't need your permission. Mata remained silent and made no move as she watched him approach. You say you cannot answer me, but isn't it that you won't answer me? You, his words dripping with bile and hate. You spin this web of babble about nothing and expect us to chase it like fools. Well, I won't, and none of you can handle that. I will become the greatest Jedi who ever lived, with or without your help. To Freedon's startlement, Matt's eyes tensed just slightly. Prove it to me, she said as her saber flashed to life. What? I don't... Matt stirred the air with the light of her blade. I say you are not a Jedi. Prove to me that you are. 
You think you could scare me away? Is that it? He said. But I won't run away like the others. No, I am the stronger. You can't defeat me with malignant will. He unhooked his lightsaber from his belt and activated it. His bronze blade, a stark contrast to Matt's shining weapon. Nad was determined to prove her, prove everyone, that he was the strongest. The two combatants took up mirroring positions in the garden, two forces ready to collide. There was one second of silence, then Nad lunged. As Nad's blade came crashing down, Matak quickly countered, throwing his blade off. With an almost imperceptible movement, she thrust her saber at the right side of his ribcage, just beneath his arm. It took all the strength Nad possessed to stop and reverse his blade and parry Matak's strike. Their match was something of a martial hurricane, both combatants striking and parrying, Nothing else mattering except who would emerge victorious. Nad struggling to keep up with Matt's blade. Then he saw it. An opening. A tiny miscalculation on Mata's part. A flaw in her technique just big enough for Nad to exploit. He took pleasure in noticing this flaw. She was so arrogant, so sure of her abilities, that she thought he an apprentice would not notice, but he was more than an apprentice, and he did notice. Nad resolved to teach the old woman and all the other masters a lesson of his own. He swung his saber in a wide arc at Mata's shoulder. She looked up as the saber came down, but instead of attempting to evade, she simply stared into Nad's eyes. As his blade swooped down, he saw something in Mata's stare, an expression of calmness and acceptance, underlined by a strength Freedun had never noticed before. In that moment, Nad knew he had failed. She had offered him a true test, and he had chosen to see it as a threat. Desperately, he tried to halt his saber, angle it away from the old master, but it was too late. As the blade of bronze light struck Mata's shoulder and carved its way across her body, her robes collapsed to the floor, bereft of the body that had held them up before, and Nad sensed nothing at all. Frieden stared at the lifeless cloth lying before him, feelings of unimaginable guilt and sorrow overtaking his mind. He clawed at the empty robes and berated himself for his failure. She was gone, and there was nothing he could do about it. However, feelings of sorrow soon turned to anger and jealousy. He felt that Mata had brought this upon herself. She didn't have to do what she did to prove her point. She didn't have to deny him what he desired. She was arrogant and therefore deserved no more pity. To Nad, the masters were to blame for Mata's death. They had denied him knighthood when he was himself their equal, no, their superior. Hate gave way to rage, and rage gave way to vengeance, and Nad knew that he would make them pay for denying him what was his. He knew that there was a path of power that the masters could only dream of. He knew of the dark side, and the ancient Sith Lords that had roamed the galaxy in centuries past. He had studied the Sith within the halls of the Asus Library, and knew they would give him the power he desired. In a fit of rage, Nad left Asus, determined to become the most powerful Sith sorcerer the galaxy had ever seen. As his ship climbed into the atmosphere, he set a course for Ashes Re an ancient system that had once belonged to the Sith Empire. As his ship prepared to jump, Freed and Nad felt the force as he had never felt it before, and he knew that his quest for Sith power had begun. The planet Ashaz had been one of the least satisfying planets Nad had ever visited. 
but the artifact he found there made the trip more than worth it. In the ruins of an old temple, he had found the holocron of King Adeus, which had been lost for centuries. Within its crystal matrix, Nad had learned of the ancient red-skinned Sith species, as well as the war that took place with the Republic and the Sith Empire in the days when Master Odan Ur was but a young knight. He had also learned of the legendary Sith Lord Naga Sadao, as well as his final resting place on a jungle moon in the Yavin system. Nad knew that even the smallest of trinkets left by Naga Sadao would yield great power, so he plotted a course for the jungle moon. When he landed on Yavin 4, Nad immediately felt the dark power coursing through the planet, and he knew that it was here that he would find what he sought. In a flash of dark side power, Nad was onset by a large horde of Masasi warriors. Freedon recognizing them thanks to the information he had gathered from King Adeus' holocron. The alchemy-bred species immediately set upon him, anxious to test the young Darksider's power. But the additional strength in the force Nad had gained during his exposition served him well, and the Masasi deemed him worthy of Naga Sadao's consideration. The Masasi led Nad to the depths of the Sith Temple, and it was there that Nad discovered to his shock, the preserved body of Naga Sadao himself. The ancient Sith Lord had apparently encased his spirit in stasis in order to survive, waiting for the day he could be reawakened by one worthy of his knowledge and power. Sensing the Sith Lord's power, Nad reawakened Sadao's spirit and requested he take him on as his apprentice. Impressed by the young man's fortitude and power in the Force, Sadao would spend years training Nad in the ways of the Sith, helping him master the ancient arts of Sith magic and showing him the intricacies of Sith culture. Nad devoured the teachings of his ancient mentor, learning more from him than he had ever learned from the masters on Ossus, his power reaching greater heights than he ever thought possible. Unfortunately, with power comes ambition, and with ambition comes a desire to rule unopposed. After he had learned all he could from his master, Nad challenged and struck down Naga Sadao, destroying his body and casting his grievously weakened spirit into the depths of the temple, where it could do no harm. Nad knew that his time had come, he was now ready to go out and conquer worlds as the Sith had done in the past, and he would have his revenge on the Jedi Order that had betrayed him. Collecting a vast treasure trove of Sith artifacts, Nad once again took to the stars, before eventually coming to Onderon. The world was harsh and strong in the Force, and Freedun sought as the perfect world to begin his empire. Using the knowledge he gained from Adeus' holocron and Sadao's instruction, Nad easily disposed of the planet's existing monarchs and assumed the role of king, crafting a crown from Onderonian iron and wearing it as a symbol of his indisputable rule. Nad transformed Onderonian culture into one steeped in Sith lore and magic, the people worshipping the dark side as the one and only true power in the galaxy. As his strength in the dark side grew, Freedun's body began to suffer under the strain of his great power. His skin became pale, his jaw slack, his eyes transformed into blinding white spheres, though these were small prices to pay for the power the Sith Lord now wielded. Nad assisted the Onderonians in the development of modern technology with which to repel the beasts and later those who refused to accept his Sith teachings. He even discovered and documented an unusual and nearly indestructible crustacean-like species that could be used as armor and fed off the dark side itself, with which he called obelisks. 
the punishment for anyone who denied Nad and his decrees was exiled from the capital city of Aizai, where they were left to face the monstrous creatures from which the walled city offered protection. However, these outcasts eventually learned to tame the wild creatures and became beast riders, who went on to stage a protracted war with Nad's empire. War drums beat, and the cry of soldiers and rider alike filled the air. But after years of war, neither side had claimed victory. Not even Nad's incredible power could put an end to this war. Onderon was subject to the unyielding power of Freed and Nad for more than a century. Rumor of his tyranny eventually became the concern of the Jedi Order, who sought to free Onderon from his rule. A team of Jedi Knights were sent to deal with the Sith Lord, and after a pitched battle, Freed and Nad and his forces were defeated. Darkness called to the Lord, but it was not the end. Nad's hate was so strong, his greed so all-consuming, that his spirit refused to be taken to the void, and his influence refused to be swept away. For many, death is the ultimate finality. But if one is strong enough, if one possesses the desire for life that is so pure that it consumes their very being, then the laws of life can be bent. Even as his physical body decayed, Nad's spirit continued to influence the people of Onderon. The rulers of Aizai continued to practice Sith magic under the Dark Spirit's watch. All through the generations were Onderonian rulers guided by Freedon's influence. The most notable individual in this line being King Amun, a direct descendant of Nad himself. While Amun's immersion in the dark side caused his physical body to deform, his strength in the Force was a match for any Jedi, which suited Nad's plans just fine. While not as powerful as her husband, Queen Aminoa ruled Onderon with Nad's fury, personally going out of her way to destroy the Beast Riders once and for all. As his descendants carried on his work, Nad began to formulate plans to resurrect himself. By teaching his descendants well, he hoped to find a powerful candidate to learn the alchemical practices of his late master Naga Sadao and use them to create a body to hold his spirit. To ensure that Amen or Amanoa would achieve the necessary strength, Nad made them compete with one another, though even as years passed, their power was not sufficient enough to carry on such a task. Nad began to fear that he would never find a suitable apprentice to assist in his resurrection, and he knew that as long as this civil war was being waged, he would never have what he desired. That all changed when a group of young Jedi, under the request of Queen Aminoa, arrived on Onderon. Resolving to end the war once and for all, Queen Aminoa requested the aid of the Jedi to quell the Beast Riders. Unfortunately, the plan was an utter disaster as the Jedi, with the aid of Queen Aminoa's own daughter and the Beast Rider's leader, overthrew Aminoa's rule and took control of Aizai. The grip of Nad's control over the planet being weakened for the first time in centuries. Enraged over the loss of his student, Nad conspired with Amun to take back Onderon and rid them of the Jedi's presence. However, Nad's true intentions were far more complex. While the loss of Aminoa distressed him, he was more interested in testing the latent power of the Jedi who had overthrown her. One in particular, a Jedi named Ulit Keldroma, interested him especially so. Nad ordered Amun to capture Ulit's master, a powerful Jedi named Arka Jeeth a task Amun was more than happy to perform. As Ulik and his Jedi allies struggled against Amun and his forces, all the while desperate to save their master, Nad watched his plans slowly unfurl. 
As expected, the battle on Onderon had garnered the attention of not only the Jedi Order, but any Force adepts interested in learning the ways of the Sith. Two of these adepts were the cousins Alima and Satal Kito, who personally met with Amen in order to help them decipher an ancient Sith tome. Sensing the potential power in these two, Nad resolved to make them the future of his work, secretly gifting them a horde of Sith artifacts and assisting in their escape. He knew they would accomplish great things in the future. As the cousins made their escape, King Amun was defeated by Ulic and his Jedi companions, the old king proving that he had outlived his usefulness. In a flash of fire, Nad appeared before the broken sorcerer, declaring that it was his time to die. Using what little influence he still had on the physical world, Nad made short work of Amun, his death signifying the end of Freedun's dynasty on Onderon. While the Jedi reveled in their victory, Nad knew that they had not won. He knew that what he had set in motion would ultimately lead to the Jedi's destruction and his return to the physical plane. No, the Jedi had not won. They had lost. Following the horrific battle, the Jedi attempted to cleanse Onderon of Nad's influence by moving his remains to the far side of Duxon and encasing them in Mandalorian iron. But mere physical obstacles mean nothing to one who does not exist on the physical plane. Freedon continued to haunt the caves of Onderon as well as visit the Keto cousins and assist in their dark side training. The pair quickly advancing in their studies and becoming powerful Sith sorcerers. Founding a Sith-worshipping cult known as the Krath, the two began to spread chaos among the stars, conquering systems and warring, conquering systems and warring with the Jedi Order. In the ensuing madness, Nad set about to put the final stages of his plans into place, his resurrection. As his spirit roamed the galaxy, he came across a young Jedi Knight who displayed great power in the Force as well as a special fascination with Sith lore. His name was Exar Kun. Making his way towards Nad's tomb on Duxon, Kun could feel the power radiating from the treasures hidden within, the dark side calling to him as if it needed him in order to be whole. Making his way towards the sarcophagus, Frida Nad appeared before Kun in a blinding flash of orange light. While Kun tried to deny his allure to the dark side, Nad could sense he was lying. Preying on the knight's desires, Nad instructed Kun to make his way to Korriban, the ancient burial ground of the Sith and home to many of their most precious secrets. Following the ghost's instructions, Kun made his way to the desolate world. The planet Korriban was a physical representation of the dark side. The lands were barren, the air cold, and the overwhelming feeling of death was everywhere. As Kun made his way through the Valley of the Dark Lords, Nad appeared before him once again and guided him to a nearby cave. While Kun showed promise, Nad needed to be certain that he was able to commit wholly to the dark side. And what better way to test one's resolve than by putting their life on the line? If Kun was willing to embrace the dark to save his life, then he would be worthy to become Nad's apprentice. The pair dived deeper into the cave until they came upon a pale red crystal pyramid. Within the structure, Kun could see what appeared to be the spirits of beings trapped within its confines, and it was clear to Kun that they were in unimaginable agony. Nad explained that they were indeed the spirits of Jedi long dead trapped within the pyramid, their spirits kept in a state of perpetual pain, unable to move on. As Kun attempted to wrap his mind around the implications of such a state, Nad finally made his move. 
Without warning, the walls of the temple came crumbling down, smashing the crystal pyramid and annihilating the spirits within. The debris also crushed Kun underfoot, breaking many of his bones and leaving him a heap on the temple floor. Nad knew that this would be the moment of truth for Kun. After this, there was no going back. He would either surrender to the dark side or be buried here among the dead. As Nad attempted to convert Kun to the dark, the ancient spirit sensed another presence attempting to reach Kun. The Jedi Master Vodosias Bass, renowned weapons master and Kun's own teacher, was attempting to reach out to him. Frida knew that he couldn't allow the old master to interfere, lest Kun be tempted to resist. Gathering his otherworldly power, Nad struck out at Boss, banishing his presence and leaving him and Kun alone. As the night lay bleeding beneath him, Nad felt the young man's resolve leave him. And finally, in a move of desperation, Kun agreed to the Sith Lord's terms. Satisfied with Kun's choice, Nad used his dark side power to heal his wounds. Though the process caused Kun such pain that his screams echoed across the stars. Once he was healed, Nad escorted Kun to the tombs of the ancient Dark Lords, hoping that their spirits would judge Kun as worthy of the mantle of Dark Lord. As Kun was beset by hordes of Tukata, the knight once again was forced to call upon the dark side in order to save his life. As his apprentice butchered the dark side beasts, Nad heard the words of the ancient dark lord speak to him. He is ready, Nad, was their response. Elated that his plans could finally move into their final stages, Nad instructed Kun to make his way to Yavin 4. The moon that centuries ago had served as Nad's focal point for his transformation into a dark lord and where the secret of new life awaited him. Landing his ship on the jungle moon, Kun was immediately greeted and captured by the Masasi, who, sensing Kun's dark power, desired to take him to the ancient temple and take part in their ritual. As Nad watched Kun be carried off, he knew that he would have to gain their favor in order to gain access to the alchemic power necessary to revive him. Frieden had come so far, so far that he could practically feel his physical body returning to him, his crown and lightsaber once again striking fear into all that viewed them. All Kun needed to do was survive the ritual. If he didn't, well, as a spirit, Nad had unlimited time to search for a replacement. The inner Colosseum where the Masasi prepared their ritual pulsed with the power of the dark side. Kun, as well as a few other Masasi, tied to ceremonial spikes. The priests attaching the ancient gauntlets of Naga Sadao to enormous spires that visibly radiated with dark side power. As the power began to build, Kun wrenched himself free of his restraints, only to be greeted by a giant dark side worm. As the beast latched out at Kun, Nad spoke to him again, telling Kun that the only way out was to use the power of the temple against the worm. Pulling to him a pair of gauntlets, Kun used their overwhelming power to obliterate the worm. The Masasi rallying to him and hailing him as their new lord. He had done it. Kun had won the Masasi over. Nad appeared before Kun, stating now was the time for their true work to begin. Frieden was anxious to get his body back, telling Kun that he hungered for flesh and power, hungered to live again. Nad's time had come after centuries of waiting, after countless failed apprentices. Finally, he would have his revenge. Finally, the Jedi would pay for what they had done to him. Finally, he would. In a flash of anger, purer than the brightest star, 
Kun used the power of the amulets to strike directly at the core of Nad's spirit, causing the Sith Lord to wail out in unimaginable pain. As he dies his second death, Nad reached out across the galaxy to contact the Keto and warn them of Kun's betrayal. In a fit of rage, he declared Exar Kun a pretender and stated that the real power of the Sith lied with them. With the last vestiges of strength leaving him, Frida Nad's spirit surrendered to utter annihilation, never again to come into contact with the physical realm. Death of the ultimate caliber. While his body and spirit may have been destroyed, the legacy of Frida Nad would continue to shape galactic history. Exar Kun and Ula Keldroma became the new Dark Lords of the Sith, Kun using Nad's teachings to wage a costly war on the Jedi Order. However, Ulic ultimately repented his sins and found redemption in the young Vima Sunrider. While Kun, unwilling to face defeat, used a powerful Sith ritual that trapped his spirit on the Yavin 4 Temple, where it remained for a millennia. Nad's holocron and documents on obelisks eventually came into the possession of the Sithari Darth Bane, who used Nad's teachings on sorcery to help instruct his apprentice as well as better understanding his obelisk armor. Thus, millennia after his death, Frida Nad's influence contributed to the advancement of the reformed Sith Order, one that eventually annihilated the Jedi Order and brought the dark side to bear in the form of a Sith-ruled galactic empire. Humility is a key component in Jedi philosophy, however, it is also one of their greatest tests. For the measure of one's humility can determine whether they will be a selfless protector or a greedy conqueror. <laughs>